they can kind of join in as we go. Hello everybody, thank you all for joining us for our final webinar before we take a break for the summer. Amelia and I have had, um, you know, we've been delighted doing these webinars. Um, it's been really exciting meeting different winemakers, meeting different retailers and um, tonight supporting hospitality. So thank you everyone for joining. I um, we'll hope to see you on the other side uh, of the summer. <laughs> um, tonight we are doing a food and wine matching session which was something that Amelia and I wanted to do from the start and we got in touch with Fiona pretty much off the bat um, so when we do one please will you join in so thankfully Fiona has joined us um, and yeah and then and then we kind of waited until we found the right food restaurant or um, food delivery partner and for those of you who don't know Adam Handling he's not here but Adam Handling um, I followed on um, on MasterChef when he was on MasterChef um, he didn't win, but I felt he should. And then when he opened the Frog, we went to the Frog, uh, which is in Covent Garden. Then when he opened uh, Chelsea, we went for afternoon tea there. The best scones ever. My mum lives in Devon, so I've had a lot of scones, but the best scones ever. And then he's just started doing Hain, which is his restaurant food at home delivery service, um, I think kicked off by lockdown as other people have too. Now he's opening up in uh, August and Calvin can talk to you about that uh, soon. Um, yeah, so it's quite quite amazing that uh, restaurants are able to open up again and we're able to go again. That's really exciting for everyone, although I haven't I haven't ventured out myself. I'm not I'm not ready, I'm not there yet, but everyone in their own time. Um, so yeah, so kind of we partnered uh, with Hain because it was something that I loved and we wanted to support hospitality with um, the wines that uh, we partnered with for this session are from Berkman who normally are trade only and they started an initiative during um, uh, dur or focus on trade uh, they started an initiative during the lockdown where um, you could buy the wines from them and by putting in a code um, you would get the customer would get five percent off, and the code that was associated to a restaurant would receive twelve and a half percent of the sales. So they were supporting hospitality through the lockdown. So we felt that this was a good opportunity for us to get involved with them as well. So thank you for anyone who has bought the wines. Oh, so we've got um, Fiona Beckett with us, uh, which is fantastic thank you so much for joining us she's the wine writer for the guardian but also does her own food and wine matching um website matchingfoodandwine.com which is something that i frequently um refer to um not just for the pairings but also for recipes and then she's also got a batonage podcast with liam stevenson master of wine um, so uh, check out those if you if you want to hear more from Fiona. We've also got Kelvin McCabe, who is um, the sommelier at the Adam Handling Restaurant Group. Uh, so in charge of all the wines and all the food and wine pairings and the man to go and ask if you, if you go to one of Adam's rest uh, restaurants, if he's there, um, to, you know, which, which wines are best. But they do do uh, recommendations on food and wine pairing, so he doesn't have to be in the room when you go. And of course, the beautiful, lovely Amelia. Thanks again, Amelia. Um, Amelia, when we first met, was at, um, like in person, was at the vineyard in Stockcross. Yes. Amelia yeah. was doing a lunch, a paired lunch, one and I had dishes lunch there, which I went to, and it was amazing. And then on top of that, I went to um, Amelia's Leafs session, which was again a fantastic lunch with um, pairings from Swig, I believe. Yes, Swig wine, who we've also paired with during these webinars. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so it was, that that was that was good. You obviously know what you're doing with your with your food and wine pairings. You've also got it as part of your course in the uh, learning with experts that you're doing. So, yeah, it's it's kind of um, you know we've got we've got food and wine experts here. So the main focus today is to get your questions 
right yes it's going to be a mostly q a session so as part of that i'm going to hand over the reins to amelia for the session and i'm going to be focusing on making sure we get your questions answered um so that i'm you know i'm not talking and trying to read at the same time I'm not able to multitask um, and then uh, and then for anyone who's not joined our sessions before um, there's there's a, a comments box and there's a q a box um, so please do write in those um, if there's a specific question that you definitely want answered put it in the q a box because the comments box can go quite quickly we won't miss it um, but i'll be checking both as we go through please drink responsibly for those of you who have bought the wines we normally do packs of three wines but today um, with Berkman we did a pack of six wines um, please don't drink all six wines please be responsible um, if you've got a Coravan or you can't see it with this or a uh, Antioch bottle stop please use those um, so that please do drink responsibly and the three wines that we'll be focusing on talking about today and the three dishes are the Dr. Madison Riesling, which goes with the Nanny Sophie's fried chicken, the zero GMT orange wine, which pairs with the mother signature dish, which is a lovely story um, from, from Adam, and then the Torn and Ladies Lane Shiraz uh, with the Beef Wellington. Uh, but like we say, it's mostly Q&As, so if you don't have the wines, if you don't have the food, we'll be taking all questions. Right, over to you, Amelia. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, yeah, I, I do, I, I'm no way, I mean, Fiona is much more experienced in food and wine pairing and writing, and she's written over 24 books on the subject. But I do think if, if you are in the wine industry and you don't really think about food or culture or what, you know, how to really enjoy wine or how this wine was even appreciated from its roots, then quite frankly, you're just a wine bore. And um, that actually takes away a lot of the pleasure and connect with other people too. Um, that being said, I do teach regular masterclasses at Leeds Cookery School and I always caveat it with, now there's various principles which we're going to go through, but at the end of the day, wine is meant to be fun and there's no judgment and action you know and at the end of the day you know people's palates can also change and we'll probably i'll be asking some questions later about kind of relativity of palate and culture and that kind of thing but i always like to start off the sessions like that and i remember my favorite gary vaynerchuk wine library tv video was when he paired wine to cereal and I was like, actually, yeah, there's times like you're working late at night for like a restaurant shop, shop or whatever, come back, you just want a bowl of cereal and a glass of wine. And we did a, a fantastic Auschlese Riesling pairing with Captain Crunch, which is a bit like uh, honey crunch, like honey pups um, over here. But um, anyway, that being said, I'm going to hand over actually to you. Know, like, how do you grasp the kind of nebulous world of wine and food pairing? And can one even have such principles in this subject? Um, I, tr I try not to, um, you know, suggest too many rules and complicated, you know, guidelines. I mean, I think there are, the most helpful thing is that I've always found is to say, approach it like, like cooking, um, you know. And so most people who are into wine like to cook a bit. They like to eat and they like to cook. And so if you think about food and wine pairing like the whole process of cooking and you're cooking something and you just think oh you know I think it needs a squeeze of lemon or you know actually I'm going to add a bit of cream to that or whatever it is you know in, in, instinctively what yeah. that dish needs and really the wine thing is it's just a bit like that you you know it, you you build experience you, you know you try things and then they lodge in, in your head but basically, it's, it's much more a question of, you know, I think being intuitive than being scientific and saying, you know, this always happens, because it doesn't always happen. No, you're right. And I mean, in terms of the books you write, how do you choose the kind of topics or themes or how do you go about navigating this world of food and um, wine? I mean, having said there are no rules, I think there's a few suggestions. So, um, I mean, well, first of all, it's, it's very rarely about the basic ingredient. Right. So, and, and actually, that's not terribly helpful because on the back of um, wine bottles, you often find, you know, goes with chicken. Oh. Um, where do you Pasta. start? Pasta is another one, too. 
Well, yes. what's the sauce? Yeah. What time? <laughs> now, are we talking a carbonara or are we talking lasagna? Are we talking yeah. with chicken? Are we talking chicken salad? Are we talking Thai green chicken curry? Are we talking coco van? Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, it's really, um, you know, think about the way you you cook something. And if you're cooking at home, uh, if you've got a recipe or something you're, you're doing, you're kind of wondering what to drink. It's just like, what is going on in this dish? And what else am I going to serve with? Um, is it a is it a light dish or is it a more intensely flavored one? I mean this kind of like you know I, I I think we're still a bit wedded to white wine with fish and red wine with meat but actually it's much more a question of like is it a light dish or is it a more intensely flavored one and light can mean you know sort of uncooked or raw um, and you know light and crunchy um, and more intensely flavoured can be seared or, or kind of like slow cooked, but you can have fish that's seared, as you know. So um, you can have um, seared tuna or you can sear salmon or you can, you know, make an intense fish stew, both of which will go with red wine. So, you know, um, don't get too hung up on, on that old mantra of kind of white, white with them. Um, Fish, and you make a, a good point about the nuances too, not just with the food, but with the wine, because Syrah and Shiraz, you know, the old world versus the new world, I like how when you do your pairings, you're like, okay, well, yes, a Syrah from France would go best with this, but if you have a new world Shiraz, then mm-hmm. you can actually experiment a bit more with spice or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, you're very, you don't, you don't just stick to the monotone grape, you know, it's not like a one kind of grape fits all. Mm-hmm. And I think also, I mean, you can, yes, it, it, it depends. It depends mm. on the cook and it depends on, on the wine. On the wine, and exactly. And you're very clear about that. If yeah. you've got something really quite special, you've tucked away. And most people, uh, as we know, kind of like hang on to wine for too long. And there's this, this kind of like lovely bottle they've been, you know, um, aching to try and eventually do it. I think there's been a lot of wine drunk during lockdown, actually. A lot of, lot of old wines being drunk. But actually, if you've got something quite fragile, you know, don't overwhelm it with loads of big flavours. Kind of think about that, you know, the, it's kind of like, which is the hero here, the wine or the food? And if, it, if it's the wine, you know, just co- cosset it a bit, coddle it, you know, like work around it. Make something very, very simple. So if you've got, um, you know, a really lovely old Bordeaux, just do something really super, super simple, like some Oslan. I mean, it sounds like, well, that doesn't sound very interesting. It doesn't have to be interesting because no. the wine is interesting. So, so we, when you get we've up, got a question on, um, so someone said that they've been given a 2005 Barolo as a wedding mm-hmm. present yeah. and they want to keep that as the hero. Yeah. Um, what, what, what should they be pairing with that to make sure that the wine sings? Um, I mean, uh, I, would, I would actually say that's the autumn. So there's a kind of like, there's a seasonal thing going on too. Um, I think Barolo goes really beautifully with, um, with sort of game birds. So like, you know, a fe- pheasant or um, um, partridge, lovely with something like that. Again, relatively simple. Um, it's very, very good with um, sort of mushrooms or truffles. So you can actually sort of bring, bring that in somewhere. But it is a kind of, it's an autumnal wine. To me. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't actually drink a Barolo on a hot summer evening. Too, too, too kind of, too silky, too subtle, too refined. You know, you're kind of outside feeling kind of summery. And, and um, so it's, it's a mood thing too, in my view. So open fire wine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, and sometimes, you know, um, I've, um, I've, uh, yeah, so I have been drinking some good bottles, and um, <laughs> uh, my son and I um, uh, shared a bottle of Grange um, uh, a few, two or three weeks back. And actually, we decided we weren't going to faff around. We weren't going to kind of rush around the kitchen making anything complicated. And we had we had cheese, which actually is not rocket science, but I don't normally like cheese so much with red wine. But we thought, well. Actually, we won't have anything terribly scary in the way of cheese, just, you know, a bit of cheese to nibble, quite mild 
cheese, not really strong or pungent, wouldn't have one of those stinky French cheeses, wouldn't have a very strong blue. You know, you've got this really lovely wine. Um, you know, just have it in a lovely glass and just nibble something with it. Don't drive yourself mad beforehand, you know, stressing yourself out in the kitchen, trying to make something very complicated. And then, you know, being in a fluster and stressing about that and not actually sitting down and thinking, oh my God, this is an amazing wine. Do you have one golden principle which you use, which, or which you like to give to people if they're really struggling at home with what to pair or that, you know, or if they're going out to a restaurant? Or, do you have any kind of a golden rule for anything? Well, I mean, that, that, that one about, you know, like what is going on in this dish, you know, how what is it meant yeah. is, is kind of my golden rule. Yeah, yeah. And I like your mood one as well. Mm. I mean, mood. and kind of like, it's, it's kind of about, it's about time of year. Um, it's about people a bit, you know. Uh, I mean, you you know, sometimes you think, uh, you know, suppose, I mean, there are different people you eat with, aren't there? Because kind of like, you know, um, sort of um, in-laws or kind of like, you know, slightly conservative relatives. You know, yes. Like, you know, there is no point in bringing out, I think, an orange wine, um, you know, on those occasions. You know, especially if you have a roast lamb. Um, which would be quite a good thing to have for, um, you know, conservative relatives. Um, you know, I mean, really give them something that you know they're going to like and they're going to enjoy because that's their palate. You kind of know what people will like. Whereas on the other hand, um, if you've been um, backpacking with them or, you know, and you've just been to Georgia, for example, or, and, um, or you've been to the Lebanon and you make some, um, amazing kind of slow cooked lamb shoulder dish then bring out the orange wine because you know your friends are really into trying things you've got this dish and it's got amazing spices and the orange wine can carry it so um you know it's it's absolutely horses for courses what in your mind was the worst ever food and wine pairing you've experienced at like at a restaurant or yeah what was just a disaster in your mind? I don't know. I'm pretty easy going actually. I mean, I don't, I don't <laughs> kind of look for disaster. <laughs> I think just the wine not being terribly nice, you know, I mean, it's more yeah. to do with, actually, that's a pretty rubbish wine. I mean, I'm really, I'm not enjoying that very much. But I, I, I think people don't often make absolute howlers of mistakes. And actually, I don't go to be shocked or, or to be you know, overwhelmed, I kind of go to enjoy myself in the restaurant. I'm kind of like, and at somebody's home, I think people worry a lot if they have people who round who know about wine. Oh, I bet people are terrified when they have you over Fiona. No offense, we're lovely, but I, I'd be slightly scared. <laughs> no, I think <laughs> my cooking would not be up. The wine business will be familiar with this. You know, your friends <laughs> think, oh my God, I don't know what to <coughs> give, give her or him to drink. So she's just quite happy to be fed. And someone give you a nice glass of wine, I think. Well, we've got some um, questions coming in, so I'll fire these, uh, yeah. fire these through. Um, one has come up from Andy um, about what to pair with Spanish tortilla. Now, I know eggs are like notoriously difficult to pair with, but what would you pair with Spanish tortilla? Well, let's, let's spike that for a start. I, think, um, I don't think there are many things that are kind of like, monstrously difficult although actually today i am um writing um a, a post for the website which is going to be t entitled um what wine if any goes with ice cream <laughs> <laughs> and actually my conclusion is actually very very few uh and you know frankly you know don't don't bother drinking wine with ice cream drink um uh drink liqueurs instead um so um so I always take a much broader, um, broader view than that. So, so eggs, actually, very, very unlikely the tortilla is going to be served by itself. That's the other thing to think about. Like, is it part of a big tapas sort of selection? Have you put a whole lot of Spanish star food together? Okay, so maybe you have. Um, so you can go down the sherry route. Um, if you know the people, again, who are kind of like really into sherry, you know, do that. 
not in my experience not everybody is mad about um um uh, sherry um sadly so actually i mean i wouldn't necessarily impose my my sherry love on them um i think um sparkling wine is pretty good with eggs so you could just like crack open a bottle of carver and that, that will go with the tortilla and it will also go with the other bits um i probably wouldn't um I probably wouldn't open a fruity white if it's if the centerpiece is tortilla, but a Rioja, a red wine, uh, a Tempranillo, perfectly nice. Um, I just don't be too daunted. Even things like artichokes, and one says, "Oh my goodness, you know, you absolutely can't, you cannot pair wine with artichokes." Well, actually, you know, kind of like if they're grilled and if they've got, got lots of olive oil on them, and uh, or maybe a dressing with a little bit of lemon. Um, zest in and you're, you've got a nice Italian white like a verdicchio or something like that it's you know you know, a bit of rosé fino sherry again there are things you know just don't think, don't don't be put off by people who say you can't do things because you can't. you've just mentioned artichoke um Lisa's put a question in of she's cooking tomorrow hake with bacon onions thyme artichoke and potatoes lovely so, recommend those same things or would you change um uh with something it sounds quite spanish um i would actually probably go for a dry rosé with that lot i think that would be quite nice a spanish risotto from say rioja or navarra um rosé is just brilliant um you know and adaptable um and at this time of year really great because you know it's summer and kind of like um, the weather is forecast to be quite nice tomorrow so rosé yeah or you could do um, orange wine if you're yes. if you know if you have if you can get hold of it but rosé is easy to get hold of and the spanish stars which are slightly sort of more full-bodied are quite good with uh, they'll carry things big flavors like hay amazing then we've got a question slightly off piece talking about maybe this is more of a conversation point rather than a question about um whether the labels or whether wine should become more vegetarian and vegan friendly to match up with you know fewer people eating meat or people being more flexible in their diet i, I mean, think I, actually um i mean many wines you know i would say the majority of wines are now suitable for at least vegetarians but you know for vegans too i mean it's just such a big thing and you know you see so certainly you see it on most own labels so it's not so much question that the wines are unsuitable. I mean, there will be the odd one, but it's really more likely to be a kind of fine wine that's sort of, um, you know, still fined with, with egg white or, you know, ice and glass or something weird. Um, but I mean, you know, I think most wines are suitable for vegetarians and vegans. What's more interesting, I think, is does the shift, and I've been thinking this for a time, does the shift towards a more plant-based diet push you rather more in the direction of white wine than red wine? Mm. And I think it actually does. Um, I mean, there are exceptions to that. If you think about mushrooms, sort of um, portobello mushrooms or something like that, aubergine, sort of big flavours. Um, yes, you know, of course, you know, red wines really come into play, but... Um, an awful lot of the kind of things that we like eating now and which we get offered in restaurants. I don't know what you think about this, Kelvin. Um, you know, think, are, are kind of more white wine than red wine friendly. I would say most, yeah, we start with mostly whites and try and mix it up with some sparkling and rosé as the progression goes. I was considering this the other day as far as more vegan and vegetarian foods come out, but then I kind of also looked at the sort of modern style of reds which seems to be lower tanning and brighter fruit and more freshness to them and kind of take on the similar characteristics that you'd be looking for in white wine for pairing anyway. If you think sort I of the modern um, styles and pinots from Australia. Yeah. I went to uh, Mirazul, which is this sort of, um, I think it was voted the world's sort of best in the world's 50 best last year. And um, we had a tasting menu um, and I think we had, must have had 10, 10 courses and about 10 different wines. One was red. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Did they mix it up with a bit of sherry and rosé or? Um, there was a sake. Yes. Okay. Yeah. There was, there was a rosé and there was an orange wine, but there was okay. only one red. 
Wow. Okay. And I think that's that's really, mm. you know, that's that's sort of quite indicative yeah. of the way things are going. Actually, I mean, I think still people absolutely love red. Apparently, okay. um, in in uh, lockdown, we've been drinking less uh, sparkling wine, which doesn't surprise me. Nothing, not a great deal to celebrate. Um, uh, but we've been drinking a lot of red wine, and particularly Malbec. So um, I think people still love a good glass of yeah, red. A good red. We did have uh, one, well, the Angolotti we're tasting later, I put with a Kek Francos, which is the sort of second dish on the pairing menu. And then we went back to white, and a lot of consumers couldn't quite get their head around going from a light red to a heavier white, uh, mm. which is quite interesting. because so I kind of let the food follow. Um, but I think in some consumers' mind, it's you always have white first, then rosé, then red. It's almost like this kind of mm -hmm. movement up through colour instead of movement of uh, intensity. I mean, it's a bit like um, cheese again, isn't it? It's like, um, you know, I mean, I think in general, white wine goes better yeah. with an awful lot of cheese. cheese. It's white. <laughs> yes. However, you know, you talk to, um, you know, your friends and, and kind of, you know, your family. I mean, like... They think you're barking, you know, it's yeah. sort of, <laughs> they would much rather have a glass of bread. Yeah. So you kind of like, um, I mean, you kind of like, I work on them, but, um, you know. Uh, <laughs> you think it's a different mood though? Do you think that's the fact that, that people, people really feel comfortable about red, but yeah. you know, when you go out to eat, particularly in, in, in sort of, um, you know, sort of quite cool sort of modern restaurants, um, a lot of the food is more white wine friendly. Do you think that's the difference between like tasting as opposed to just drinking and enjoying the mood? You know how you said there's like a difference, like when there's like a mood going on and actually people are prepared to like, okay, yeah, I'm drinking goat's cheese with Malbec and they're not really thinking this actually accentuates the mm. alcohol and the tannin and you know, we're, you know, we're probably like more used to that, but actually most people when they're doing it, it's, it's, it's a, quite a lot of it is, it's psychological. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm having a wonderful embracing red with a great cheese board and with family. So they don't notice maybe so much those nuances. Mm. Um, but then if, on the other hand, I think it's partly because with cheese, here's, here's, here's kind of like not a rule, but a kind of suggestion um, is that, um, you know, people kind of do feel when they have people around that they have to serve five different cheeses um, mm -hmm. yeah. and five or six different cheeses. And then um, actually it's almost impossible for one wine to go with more, was actually if you thought about it, if you thought, you know, well maybe you're drinking an amazing um, wine with the main course and you want to carry on drinking that, you could actually choose a, a cheese that would go with it really, really well. Um, and just like have a fabulous example of that cheese. Um, uh, and if you if you want to have the big cheese board, yeah, just like have a much less complicated wine. What about an off dry white, a kind of like a Gewurztraminer or something like that, mm -hmm. which would be able to stand up to the briny and the stinky and the pungent and the creamy? Do you think yeah, something like that? I, mean, I think it's a bit of a, a marmite wine, Gewurz. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, like if you if you love it, you love it. Like, love dry Viognier or something. Like, I just if, like, if, if you don't, you kind of like it's not going to help to know that yeah. um, actually it's amazing with Munster and um, yeah. <laughs> um, it's actually very very good with um, ginger. It's um, like uh, um, sort of curries that are um, strong in ginger or dishes that are strong in ginger it are, are, are always great with Viognier. Yeah, more like a Viognier or something. I'm just like thinking okay. if people just had to, have, if they wanted to serve the five cheeses and they had like one yeah. white wine or something, I don't know, I was like thinking. Mm. Yeah, no, I think Viognier would be a good one or kind of old vine Chenin or something like yeah. that. Yeah, kind of rich. That would be a safe one. It would be nice, yeah. yeah. Well, Calvin, I think now would be a good time maybe just to talk about, I don't know how many people have the wines in front of them. Again, you don't have to have them at all, but what made you choose these wines, in particular the ones which we're going to, the three which we're going to be focusing on, and what made you choose these three dishes and how did you pair them together? Well, the wines, I looked at the dishes first um, and okay. of course yep. we chose the three dishes that seem to be the most popular from uh, the Haim Enterprise at the moment. Um, Adam, yeah, he's a master, you know, was on a runner up on Master Chef, and yes, we look at fine dining, but he's very much about, you know, comfort food and big flavors and, and things that are very, very accessible. So, with the Welly and Nanny Sophie's Chicken, I was very much looking at things that people would really love to 
enjoy at home. Um, the mother is quite specific to him. Um, that's one of his special dishes. Um, I, I guess I'll tell you the story now. Uh, effectively, before he was going to open the Caxton Grill, which was his first restaurant in London, um, he spoke to his mum the night before he was going to drive down from Scotland. Um, and he was telling his mum, I can't wait for you to taste all, all these new dishes. I've done loads of new stuff. I can't wait for you to taste. And his mum decided to tell him that um, she decided yesterday that she would be vegetarian. So overnight, he had to come up with a dish for his mum to cook for her to ensure that she had something because um, he was very, very much meat focused. And he's, he's not a big vegetarian or vegan guy. He's got better. But back then, he wasn't really. Uh, he was very much a, a meat focused kind of chef. Um, he does great vegetable dishes. But that was something he had to throw together really, really quickly. And it was kind of looking at you know, the best that comes from below the ground and above the ground um, and put something together very, very quickly. So I'm not sure if it's uh, affectionately or unaffectionately called mother. <laughs> so this <laughs> in the restaurant. I never quite well, is it an affection thing or, you know, is it a, <laughs> just, just a reminder. <laughs> um, but yeah, the mother dish is, um, it's a salt baked celeriac, um, which is kind of really made into parcels. Uh, the filling is a cream cheese, lime, date, um, truffle cream cheese, lime and date. Um, that's kind of wrapped up. Um, and then you have a nice, uh, green apple on top with a dried set powder. Um, so, a yeah. lot of challenging there. I think um, I'm, I'm fairly good at pairing after doing it for so many years, but you know, sometimes you don't always get it right the first time. You might need to try a second or a third kind of tasting additional wine to see how things react. Um, I think it took me about five or six wines to kind of understand what was happening with the dish because you pretty much got everything. You know, you have acidity from the apple and lime. You've got the richness. I didn't say egg yolk as well. Egg yolk, cream cheese. Oh, wow. Wow. You've got all the richness in there as well. Um, then you have all these earthy umami flavors from the set, the truffle and the slirex. So it's quite quite an interesting um, thing to get my head around. Um, and we do sort of a regular pairing and a premium pairing. So I did in a sense, you, you kind of got to think of a concentration of fruits. You know, either need a ripeness and off dry style or really concentrated fruits cope with the sweetness of the date um, and the intensity of the cream cheese. Um, you need great acidity to cut through the richness of the center, but also to pair the acidity that's there with the apple and the lime. Um, and then at least some sort of sense of either a bit of herb or very, very mineral character that works. that really kind of picks up those earthy umami flavors at the bottom end. So um, that's how I came to the zero G, the orange wine. Um, which wow. is a Müller Targau, um, which is quite overlooked. Uh, Müller Targau sort of saved the German wine industry after the Second World War and actually kick-started the New Zealand wine industry before Sauvignon Blanc. It was one of the main grapes there as well. Um, but a high-yielding, not particularly interesting grape. Um, but I do find uh, with certain styles, with orange styles, I kind of find that it's the more muted varietals that become very, very aromatic and interesting, um, or it styles that are already very, very floral, uh, Zabibo or Muscat de Alexandra, for example, seem, seem to me to do the best styles. Um, and yeah, with, with that style of wine making, you do have that lovely, almost like a chamomile tea, black tea, very, very savory mineral character that really works with the earthiness. Um, great freshness there with Müller Targau, so it kind of handles the acidity issue. Um, and the fruit's really, really concentrated. It's quite voluptuous. It's almost like a sort of a honey, honey mango skin or something, very, very, almost tropical. And yeah, that, that's how I came to that, that wine and that conclusion. Fiona, what did you try did you taste the mother when you came, Fiona, yeah, did you taste the mother when you came for the dinner? Because you came for the yap dinner uh, for the 50, 50th birthday, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did, did you have the mother dish? I can't remember if we if we ha if we I'm served not it sure that day or not. Dish, but, um, I have to say that that uh, that occasion was possibly sort of shrouded in a certain amount of fog by the end of the. <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot of bottles on the table. That was a yeah. great lunch. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I'm not sure how you feel about. Um, up our, is, um, sorry, I sorry, picked up. I picked up that. Um, Almost lap singing kind of notes in yes. in, in, in that wine. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was you know you really got those sort of tea tea kind of flavours. I, I prefer. I mean, I think orange wine became a little bit of a thing, um, and I always said that. Yeah, you know, if it's kind of a little bit too much skin contact, a little bit too much oxidation, then sometimes you do tend to have a little bit of this overbrewed tea character, which I'm not particularly fond of. I prefer the sort of light. Slightly more pretty, more fragrant, more characterful styles of orange wine. There was a style when, you know, if it was really, really sort of almost like sandalwood and over brewed tea, then it was, was great. But at the style, I kind of, I kind of moved. Do you find that style. with Adam's, as you say, quite experimental, very flavorful um, dishes, actually orange wine has really helped you out? Particularly, with, I mean, that um, the most hedonistic vegetarian dish ever. 
to, to a certain degree, yes. Uh, Adam absolutely hates any of the most orange wines, most uh, biodynamic okay. or slightly funky wines. It's very, very classical. So um, okay. I think, yes, to a certain degree, it's always good to have that feather in your bow. I mean, I kind of cover all bases with my wine lists. I mean, wines from all over the world and all different styles. Um, it's great to have an orange wine. It's handy. Um, but with this dish, you know, I've kind of I've paired a classic uh, Northern Rhone from Brazem. Um, I've done a very, very more simple Grunewald Lina that was off dry as well. So you kind of pick what, what you want. Um, but I just, yeah, with this, this particular sense, that slightly more sort of bitter, grippy character works with the earthiness of the dish. And then was the beef Wellington dish, that presumably was more simple for pairing? Yes, it should be more simple. I think the only thing that probably throws it off a little bit is um, he has haggis as the stuffing, a haggis and chicken breast mousse. So you get slightly um, more sort of gamey, slightly meaty flavors around. Uh, but which is pretty easy, easy to handle. But yeah, we kind of went for the heartier Ladies Lane Shiraz from Heathcote, uh, sort of biodynamic um, production with which Chaputier is involved with. I, I think for me, when you have those slightly more sort of gamey or awful flavors, I kind of look for a little bit of meatiness in the wine, um, which works really, really well. But you can also counteract that with really strong, concentrated, bright, juicy fruit, which obviously the Heathcote has as well. Um, and once again, freshness, very good freshness in the wine because you, you do have to cut through the, the fillet and the pastry itself as well. Um, and I think both, both wines we were looking at was also a, a softer texture. I find with fillet, not, not to go too, too particular, I find this sort of grain and cut in the meat um, really affects the structure of the tanning as well. So I kind of, towards a fillet, I prefer much either aged, developed tannings or softer tannings from warmer climates. So in terms of the cuts, how would that work? So the more delicate cuts you would pair with presumably a certain... For me, for me, I find yeah, slightly different tanning structure. So if you, if you kind of look at a more of a ribeye, you kind of can go for a bit more sort of grippy, more grainy. Uh, when you look at pheasant, you look at very, very fine tannings, like we said before, Barolo, Northern Italy. Um, so yeah, the kind of texture of the meat I look at as well sometimes for the tanning structure, just, just for the added additional texture as well as the flavor. Totally. And we skipped over the chicken. And actually, when we first heard that you were doing the chicken dish, Fiona rightly wrote in the email, what are the ingredients? Because again, <laughs> It's a bit like those wine bottles when it says yeah. chicken, like, well, what Sophie's chicken, chicken yeah. So can you, can you explain? <laughs> I, I think that, that was the most, um, yeah. one of the most favorite dishes. Um, so Adam has a little son and the baby mother's mum, uh, nanny Sophie is always at home as a nanny and, and cooking. Um, she's, she's absolutely, absolutely amazing. And she does fantastic, uh, fantastic spicy dishes and great dishes. And this is her kind of home fried chicken. So, you know, it's like kind of a galangal, which is a spicy fermented sauce uh, with lots of ginger and uh, sweetness in the sauce as well. You have soy. Um, and then at the end, you have fresh coriander and lots of squeeze of lime. Um, and it's corn, um, corn flour with pepper as well. So lovely, crispy chicken with a really, really sweet sauce. And then that citrus of the lime and, and aromatic of the coriander. Um, so I kind of, yeah, went a very, very classical pairing in the sense of an off-dry Riesling. Uh, once again, need that freshness to cut through the fat of the chicken where it's been fried. Um, with sweeter flavors, I think you either really need a very concentrated flute or a slightly off-dry style. And once again, with spice as well, exactly the same, either really concentrated fruit or slightly off-dry uh, flavors too. But there's a really pretty kind of floral sense um, in that wine as well. And I think that kind of just picks up on the coriander and more delicate ginger flavors as well. I think also um, with a dish like that, it's, it's nice to have your wine really cold. And because um, like sometimes you don't want your white wine too cold, but actually that, that, that particular style, that off dry style suits being, you know, yeah. suits being cold. And you've got like lovely sort of crunchy, crunchy uh, dish with, um, you know, lovely cold wine. And it's, it's a great combination, I think. I love, I thought that was a great pairing. And I'm not sure about you as well, but with fried foods, I tend not to be able to wait if I'm hungry. So I end up burning my mouth a little bit anyway. So the colder the wine, the better too. <laughs> <laughs> but again, like, um, I remember like on the series, one of the wine show, um, my co-presenter, Jay Fasherini, goes off to China and, and he has to be a sommelier in a restaurant in China. And there they have like so many words for tannins, like about, yes. because there's, like, there are tea drinking cultures. They've got about yeah. 50 different adjectives for tannins. It's not just like, oh yeah, medium plus, medium minus. They teach at WSET, you know, like it's, um, <laughs> it's, it's way more, uh, yes, intricate. But, um, but they're so used to spicy food, particularly I think he was like in the Sichuan region. So in, in terms of, I guess, how you would go about wine and food pairing in a restaurant, how you would teach 
your psalms and how you go about curating your lists, you're taught, okay, well, if you're having a spicy, fiery dish, you kind of want to quell that, you want harmonious, and, you know, just try and create harmo harmony on the palate. Whereas in Sichuan, they're used to big, bold flavors. So it's like, no, no, with the spice, let's get out the big, bold reds. Yeah. Wow. Fan up the yeah. cannon, <laughs> fan up the heat and the alcohol. And I was like, you know, it's, wow. it's interesting then because it's like the cultural relativity of taste, I, I yeah. guess. But, um, yeah. Yeah. Would you agree too with that, Fiona? Like, it is just quite interesting. To yeah, see that. I mean, I remember, um, you know, sort of uh, reading that and, and, and then, um, you know, sort of thinking about a lot that actually, if you like chilly heat, mm -hmm. then actually what you're after is something that actually accentuates the heat. You don't mm -hmm. want it done. done. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, I tell you, uh, the wine, I, so I don't know if everyone has this um, Cabernet Franc. Did, did, did that go around or the... Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Because actually I thought, um, I thought that would be um, very delicious with the Wellington too, actually. Um, yeah. Lovely, juicy, really concentrated, yeah. almost blueberry it's, fruit. It's quite, very, it's very quite silk velvety too. Strange and velvety. I mean, it's a really lovely, a beautifully balanced um, wine. I'd be very happy to drink that. I mean, I think, I think the uh, Ladies Lane sort of picks up on the haggis note. But um, the that Frank um, would be lovely with uh, with with the Wellington as a whole, I think. And hadn't you also thought, um, Calvin, to put that in mind with a vegetarian dish too? The past there's like an Aglonotti dish too. You were thinking. Ah, uh, yeah. So with with with, with the Aglonotti, um, I think it's a squid ink pasta, um, and you have a nice creamy sauce, and and obviously the mushroom is very delicate. So. I kind of look at the weight of the tannings. I'm kind of sort of more medium bodied. I, I'm kind of sort of more light to medium. The, 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 the pairing in the restaurant is actually a Kek Francos, which kind of has more of a, a, a Pinot Noir kind of, of, of structure. Um, but with this one, I was looking at um, the truffle hounds, uh, which is, which is uh, Nebbiolo, um, which has this really sort of subtle, more medium bodied, um, but once again, it has, has almost like a bitter herb, kind of garrick kind of style, which really works and brings out that savory gentleness and a mushroom. Um, I think with vegetarian dishes, mm -hmm. in, in certain, I have to agree with Fiona, it's sometimes quite difficult to pair reds with vegetarian vegan dishes unless you can't start to go a little bit a little bit more on the wackier side of unfiltered and you know, maybe a little bit more of a, a slightly cidery vinegar and kind of freshness in the wines, um, which I don't always enjoy personally as a wine on their own, but sometimes look towards the styles. I have a few on the list which actually work better with the pairings. Um, because in the restaurant, it's, you know, when, apart from the glass selection, when we do the pairings, it is almost like a degustation. We've chosen the wine pairings. So there's quite a lot of times people will look at the wine, taste it, and just like with horror on the face, what is this? And I just say, just wait, just wait, taste the food, taste the dish. And then they're like actually happy. It becomes their favorite wine kind of thing. So um, yeah, it's, it's definitely harder with, with uh, vegetarian vegans to kind of approach the classical red uh, pairings. I think Cabernet Franc is only going to get more and more popular, I, yeah. I think, in, in terms of, you know, whether you want the lighter, bright style from the Loire, but even just like the expressions I'm finding from California and things like California's that. California's fantastic. Argentina's amazing examples. It's, mm, it's really, lovely. it's really picking up. Yeah. And it's just slightly more versatile. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Fiona, go ahead. I'm yes. I'm saying how much I like it. Yeah. And also I did think this, I thought the um, truffle hunt was really interesting. Because one of the things that was interesting was that it was under 12%. Yes, yeah. That's and actually, I was, I was wow. like, oh. it had um, an incredible intensity of flavour for a wine of that um, moderate alcohol. Um, I mean, I, and I think it was probably the, the slight bitterness, actually, that carried it. Um, I thought that was a really extraordinarily interesting wine. It's and, great. Uh, their, their, yeah. whole, their whole range is, uh, yeah, delicious. They do some really, really great stuff. They do some uh, single vineyard uh, fiennos as well on different soils, uh, mm -hmm. which you should check out, which is really, really fascinating. Um, and another great orange wine as well with uh, Zabibo, Musket de Alexandra. But uh, oh, yeah, yeah they're, they're very, very talented uh, husband-wife duo making wine. Yeah, and the way, for, those who didn't, um, for those who didn't buy the wines, what we did is we put together a case where we had the three dishes that we wanted to show off from Haim partner those with wines and then um, add in some extras as a kind of see you through the summer um, with your with your dinners at home and um, yeah so we added in a couple of others so we've got the um, the Cabernet Franc um, that we we're talking about um, 
that's that one there which is absolutely stunning wine and then amelia you requested a shannon yeah. block so well, I did it for a couple of reasons. We've got the Babylon's Peak in there, yeah. which is what I've been sipping on this evening, and it's absolutely delicious, so thanks for this. <laughs> well, I, I kind of do, because I feel like that, for me, is like a go-to grape, Chenin Blanc, like for your Sauvignon Blanc fans and your Chardonnay fans, you know, particularly Chenin Blanc from the Swartland, South Africa, you get that lovely concentration of fruit flavour. You don't need the oak, so it unites people who want purity of fruit and freshness, but also people who love, like, a little bit of flesh and uh, body in their glass but I just also find like Chenin Blanc like quite it is pretty versatile with food and also due to now South Africa banning alcohol sales again I just kind of want people to be drinking more South African wine and, and to be supporting them as much as they can so there's a kind of double reason for that. <laughs> I thought yeah. that was like I had actually tried that Chenin but I think it was an amazing example do have that a high altitude freshness, dry farms as well. It's concentrated, as you said. Um, Chenin Blanc was quite interesting in South Africa. They seem to have kept changing the mind of the style they wanted to make. Uh, sometimes it's all mellow, it's creamy. Other times it's just tons of oak. And, um, but I very much like that slightly more aromatic, fresh style. I think style. that is. So it's a, it's a Swartland one, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, yes, Swartland. Yeah. I mean, I, think, I do think it does particularly well out there. So, um, yeah, uh, I mean, it, it, you know, it's 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 rich without being cloying. It's kind of really nicely balanced, I think. Yeah, we had we had some. Uh, I I got a tip from um, Lisa, who's actually on tonight. Um, she's well into her South African wines, and she recommended the Babylon's Peak. So yeah, a great tip. choice. Great choice. Mm. And Calvin, like, how would you go about curating this? Because I was reading somewhere that you were going to take a break after working at Roca and then Adam's menu terrified you and yet it morbidly fascinated you at the same time and you just felt like you had to work there. How did it terrify you? Yeah, I think it was, yeah, I was coming, well, it's actually coming from um, Yoalcha to, to uh, Adam's. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Roca was, was quite a few years before for a long, long part of my life. Right. Um, but yeah, it was just, just coming from Yalta. It oh, yeah, was sorry, Yalta. just looking at how many different flavors there were and how much concentration, because um, he's, he's very much on the volume of flavor when you look at things like the mother dish. He's really about big flavors. Um, and because of his tours you know, around Asia and, and Thailand and everywhere, he does put in that influence in which I'm really comfortable with but it was the way it was putting it with modern British um, and you kind of see the platings on the food and how pretty it is you need to make sure that you're doing the food justice so in a sense I was a bit like wow I've never had to pair these styles or combinations of flavor together so it was very very daunting in that sense but then that's the kind of challenge I really really needed because you know, <laughs> I kind of got through uh, classical pairing from from very young young age to be honest uh, and then sort of went through Japanese and then did sort of uh, Chinese and so it was and Pan Asian, of course, was a big thing in London for a while. So it was just great to kind of see that different approach to food and how he put things together, which, which made it more exciting. Um, but once I got to taste the dishes, I put the wines together, I was actually um, very comfortable again. I, th I think I was just making myself a little, a little bit scared for no reason because it was a, a, quite a big move for a, for a big name chef. And, uh, but yeah, once, once you, I think once you have those fundamentals and passion and understanding of, of flavors and characters in food and how they work with wine, it's, you kind of fall into it pretty, pretty quickly, which is good. Did you find that um, newer wines were easier to pair with his food than, than kind um, of classical I, ones? I think for, for a lot of the main course meat dishes, yes, I would agree. Um, absolutely. But I, I'm very... I'm very hard on myself to make sure that I have a wine from a different country, um, especially on the discovery menu, our, our sort of um, entry level um, wine pairing. Uh, with the premium, not so much, I, I don't push myself, but I make sure that there's a real sense of discovery and a real journey for, for our guests that come in. So, you know, it, it's going, whether it's going Romania or Bulgaria, or, uh, you know, off to Hungary. Um, and I really push sort of the, the more new, obscure, fresher styles of Australian winemaking as, as well. Um, I think definitely for the meat courses, you know, it was pork belly with kimchi spice that was very much on a, on a, on a sort of new world, juicier reds. Uh, we did a Wagyu, uh, which was, you know, with pickled seaweed and, and other flavors as well that I actually did with the Between Five Bells Pinot Noir from Geelong as well. Um, but outside of that, um, I was quite surprised how classical styles also worked with the combinations as well. Um, and then I kind of got a rhythm for his style of food. And then I looked more for the flavor profile 
um, of the wine I might try um, and grab bottles from, from wherever in the world. But it, the most important thing is that you really go through a journey on that, that menu and, and you might have one country twice on the nine course menu, but I really try to get a wine from every different country if I can. Mm. I also read that you said that there's no walls with Japanese cuisine. What did you mean by, can you just really uh, go crazy and drink I anything? Think, I, think, I think no walls, it's, 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 it's effective if, you, if you're in a, an Italian restaurant, um, you're kind of gonna go towards um, it's Italian wines, the same in a French restaurant. It's right. you kind of have your classical pairings and your regional things. You know, you, you don't go to a Spanish tapas and start asking for, you know, so, say Chianti or Barolo because they just kind of, I, I think it's, it's a regional thing from Europe. Um, it's something that we, didn't, we don't have in London. We're just starting to have sparkling wine now, but we've always been importers. So we've always had the sense that, you know, we can import and serve and drink any wine from anywhere in the world. And with Jap Japanese foods, apart from the kind of cliche that it's sake, there's not really any rules or boundaries. So when I was working with Japanese food, there was no walls for me. And I was in you know, the most vibrant wine scene in the world. So that's, that's what I was meaning by that. Yeah. I've got, so um, questions. Yeah, I've got, a, I've got a question for you, Calvin. Now, something that, um, that I talk about in my pop-up wine bars, and Lisa's just uh, touched a question on this, is, um, Often when you find either a wine writer, a journalist, um, someone in the wine industry, a teacher who has the same taste as you, you can kind of follow along that what they drink, you'll generally like what they drink. So Lisa's question to you, whether it's in line with this or not, is what do you like to drink not with food? So just, oh, not with food. Um, just drinking wine. I'm very much into um, the artisanal microbreweries and beers that have been happening. Uh, lots of the, 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 you know, the double dry hopped IPAs, uh, the insane stuff that's coming from you know, Cloudwater, Northern Monk Brewery. Uh, there's Omnipolo is an absolute favorite as well. Um, you know, just to weird things like from coconut sour or, um, yeah, I'm very much into the sour beers and double IPAs. And I, I've just had a wonderful place open uh, near me in Tottenham and Seven Sisters uh, that does the most amazing Italian pizza with lots of craft beers as well. So if I'm not thinking about pairing and I'm relaxing, I'm, I'm very much, very much beer focused. Um, if not, then I really can't get away from a margarita or a Negroni if it's uh, the right warm evening. Because <laughs> Fiona, you've written about beer and food pairing. How does that differ with wine? Um... It behaves slightly dif differently because there isn't the same acidity in beer. Um, there tends to be um, there tends to be quite a bit of carbonation that can carry uh, flavour. So one of the things that I noticed when I was um, I did a book actually once on um, uh, called an appetite for ale, which was all about actually cooking with and pairing with beer. And um, one of the things you, you notice is that <coughs> with wine. Um, if you get the same flavour in, in wine that you get in a dish, um, that if it's in the dish, it will tend to cancel out the flavour in the wine. So um, if you have, um, for example, um, a peach flavoured dessert um, and a kind of um, a dessert wine that sort of tastes slightly peachy because the flavour in the dessert is more intense, it will kind of knock it out of the wine. With beer, it doesn't happen because there's a level of carbonation it will actually carry that um, flavour in the drink and you'll still get to taste it um, with the dish. Um, I found that fascinating. I didn't, yeah. uh, I didn't expect that. Um, it was uh, but, um, great fun in Hoxton. We were doing a beer pairing as well with the wine pairing. So you had the wine pairing and the beer pairing option because uh, we yeah. had one of the largest selections at the front shop uh, on the Old Street side. So yeah, it was really fascinating to see a completely separate approach to how you would wine to, to beer. Was uh, yeah. really interesting. You're kind of almost mm -hmm. looking more texturally how much hoppy flavors, how much bitterness is there. Uh, but like you say, yeah, the, the, the actual carbonation of freshness in the beer made a, a, a huge impact on, on how the food sort of married towards the end of the palate. With the carbonation of, with beer, do you find that with wine as well, that the carbonation in, the, in sparkling wine carries the flavors? Yeah, so actually, yeah, um, fizz. Um, I mean, uh, I don't think um, champagne producers really like you to make a parallel, but actually, you do find that um, <laughs> food that goes with beer will also go with, often will go with sparkling wine or champagne, mm -hmm. particularly fried things. Yeah, yeah. 
we've got a, another question, which is, um, okay, let's move away from all the vegan, vegetarian comments that we talked about earlier. What do you like to pair with an in-your-face meat or game dish? An in-your-face meat or game dish? Um, well, um, of the wines we've got here, I mean, I would, I would go for that Cab uh, Cabernet Franc. I think that's amazing. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with an absolutely cracking bottle of, um, of red with, you know, with a kind of char heavily char-grilled steak. I mean, lovely. You know, it's kind of natural register for it. You know, people like steak and Malbec for a reason. You know, sometimes you don't want to kind of reinvent, you know, the wheel. You know, if, if well, something, and I think so, there are kind of um, so called terroir based um, matches that are kind of like a grown up together and they work. So, you know, like if you go to the Loire and you're, you're in Nantes, for example, um, and you're eating oysters, you know, you, you drink um, Muscadet. And if you're down on the Languedoc coast, you do the same thing and you, you drink people. So actually sometimes those kind of like, um, you know, they've been there forever. Um, yeah. You know, don't always feel you've got to do it a different way. Yeah, but, sometimes, but sometimes do, you know, um, have fun, you know, it doesn't have to always be, you know, a straight path. I keep smelling this um, Shiraz, it's absolutely divine and, you know, people who know me know I love my Aussie wines, but this is amazing and we've got uh, a barbecue tomorrow and I think, I think this is going to go amazingly with that. I might just have to uh, have a glass tonight before sharing it with my husband. <laughs> not going to be much less. <laughs> You, I think. <laughs> <laughs> this is a bit off topic, but you know how we were talking about vegetarian food, vegan food, lighter, brighter, reds, that kind of thing. Carmen, how many people, when you serve them wine, are actually that concerned with alcohol? I think people are, from my perspective, like I think people are getting more engaged and worried yeah. about. I think it's really, I think that's really important, actually. Um, uh, I mean, um, when I did the Guardian column, all my recommendations um, list the alcohol, have done actually since I've been doing it. Um, but I'm certainly conscious that people are, are, are pleased when they see, I mean, like they would absolutely love that truffle hand because, you know, a 12% wine that has lots of, 12% like, red in particular, that has lots of flavour is a real find. So, um, you know, people are looking for that. I think people do want don't necessarily want a 14.5 some do but quite a lot don't i think i definitely get it more um for by the glass requests people are quite conscious of the alcohol level occasionally people kind of ask what it is with a bottle but obviously if you're drinking a bottle there's not much getting away from uh, your 13 or 14 there's not much of a jump but i think when we do the wine pairing um it's it's kind of a little bit irrelevant because you know you're going to be drinking seven to ten wines anyway right so you're, you're there for the long haul either way different, it's a different crowd <laughs> yeah. yeah it's a different different mindset completely <laughs> the um the riesling that we've got is only 10 percent yeah no um actually yeah i have behind me a washington riesling and that was washington state riesling and yeah that was really pleasant it was uh, well no that's like 12.8 so still hmm, yeah <laughs> but I think but I think it's a great a lot of a lot of the modern um, sort of the Australian and New Zealand reds that are coming out have, have, have really been on that sort of lower lower alcohol lower tanning and brighter, it's a, it's juicier um, fruit, which is uh, a trend to um, in beer and in cider now actually there's um, uh, a producer called Little Pomona um, who have brought out a table cider which is kind of like a designed a kind of like a kind of no kind of band of tub, a kind of quaffing cider, which I think is 4.5, 4%. Okay. But anyway, delicious. In fact, I might, I might eat carrot. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Just while she pops out, um, we've had a, a request for the details on the dishes and the wine pairings from tonight. What I'll do is I'll pop that into the email that comes it's, out. Uh, it's not. It's, it's table size, but it's not table alcohol. It's 7.3. So, <clears throat> um, but actually, um, uh, I, I I mean I really really love their um, uh, their ciders. So this is like 
he was saying to Calvin, what, what was he drinking at the moment? And I am drinking a lot of cider because I think there's, there's a kind of complete cider revolution going on and there are some really, really interesting drinks. Some, some great anyway, stuff. Um, and also I love that, you know, that is just the cutest. And that is so place. cute. Yeah. What else do little Pomona do? Alan, Alan just mentioned they do every, like a lot of different things. What else um, do they, no, do? they are cider producers in, in, in Herefordshire, but they do, um, I mean, they've got um, one uh, really interesting, um, uh, no, I think I'm confusing this with, they've got, they've got two new ones, which they call Ciderkins. And so they're low alcohol ciders, and I think they are 3.5. And one is infused with quince, you know. They're kind of doing all sorts of incredible stuff. I was, I was joking with a sommelier friend the other day. He's, he's more on the natural wine scene. And I said, well, it's understandable. All of, all of your customers are going to cider now because that's how the white, this, it tastes like the whites you were serving previously. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had a little joke with you. It's kind of um, a really, really interesting crossover between drinks now. So, um, you know, there are, there are kind of um, hybrid kind of beer and cider. You know, there are ciders that are made with hops mm -hmm. and there are the kind of beers that are kind of like tasting you know, a bit more like ciders and, and wine, you know, mm. for a while, like, you know, people it's in a slightly derogatory way that actually mm. this wine like cider, but actually, you know, the, 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 the boundaries between drinks it's are becoming far mm. blurred yeah. and some yeah. really, really interesting drinks. Are. Re Rene Renegade Winery did um, a, a, small, a smaller beer brief in the beer can with some Savelle and another beer hop. So it became like an aromatized wine, which was absolutely delicious as well. Really some, yeah, very interesting things starting to emerge. Well, what's happening here in LA, because of course everything's like very health conscious and that. so you're getting very weird though hybrid things like hard kombucha, yeah. which was going to be a similar like kind of flavor profile. Um, I'm really annoyed that Barefoot brought the hard um, seltzer the spark, the, the, the alcoholic sparkling water, because that was going to be my make a million plan. But um, I'm not going to compete with that. I, I, I have to admit that I, I do tend to put gin and kombucha because I think the flavor is amazing. If I have kombucha, a little, a little bit of gin is just, just wonderful for your yeah, That's really popular here, yeah. yeah. But I, I think telling yourself that you're helping your gut by having spice. Yeah, exactly. How, healthy <laughs> drinking. Kombucha <Yeah>. is not. <laughs> healthy drinking. Do it for flavor and not for gut health. <laughs> Awesome. Do we have any other questions? No, so I just wanted to um, yeah, say that uh, we've got, I'll send out that so, uh, tomorrow, anyone who attended will get an email, um, uh, you know, saying thank you for joining. I'll put in there the details of the dishes and of the wines um, and also, uh, you know, the links, links for those as well. If you're still interested, the wines I think are available are going to be available for one more week, and then they're taking it off because everyone's opening back when they're taking them down. Um, but also on top of that, um, uh, Adam's done some videos um, of like of him cooking the dishes at home, or not cooking the dishes, but if you order from home and you get get them, he shows you how to kind of put it together. Um, I watched the pasta one the other code, day. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You get and a QR was... code as well, yeah, and it shows you. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah but the pasta one uh, i was just like i have to i have to try this dish it's amazing <laughs> but in there he he kind of explains what's in what's in the dish as well so if you want to check out those videos um i think you can get to those through the Haim website um so yeah or just google it you should be able to find it uh and that's that's been it for questions has anyone got any more questions before we wrap up I saw someone earlier on um, mentioning um, uh, Conte and um, Jura wine um, when we were talking about the um, white wine and cheese thing. That is a really good, really good combination. Yeah. And this is a kind of uh, kind of a fly in the ointment. When I go to a restaurant, unless it's a you know food and wine matching thing where they've you know someone like Calvin's gone to the effort of putting it together, where I will will do it. I tend to just order the food that I want and I order the wine that I want so I kind of go against <laughs> what we're supposed to do. People you know and that is a perfectly normal thing to do you know um, but there are wines that are more flexible you know than I mean if if we think about like what would go so we're talking about lighter red so um, 
you know, at this time of year, Beaujolais would be quite a good thing to order with a whole lot of things. Um, you know, lighter Grenache, Mencia from Spain, you know, these sort of ju juicy, quaffing, easy, fin de soif, the French call them. And um, then, uh, you know, in terms of whites, you know, Grunewald, you know, kind of rubs along with, you know, many, many things. Um, I like um, Hungarian ferment, I think is a really good, um, adaptable um, wine. I quite like um, Alsace Pinot Blanc in a, in a restaurant, I kind of stumble across it. So actually, um, I, I think, yes, you know, order, um, order, order the kind of wine you want and order the food you want. But I think if I was in a group, I wouldn't choose something in the same way that I probably wouldn't choose a, a dish that kind of like sounded a bit out there. I probably wouldn't choose Gewurztramina for a group because I don't think everybody's going to like it. Um, whereas, so I kind of like, I, I want those food friendly wines that are going to just like rub along easily with, with uh, anything you throw at them. I think, I think you asked me before, so um, what, what do I do when there are everyone having a different dish on the table um, and, and they want to pair one wine. Um, I just have to be honest. I, I kind of tell them what, what dishes will work the best and what won't. Um, and we have a great glass selection. So if they really want a bottle, I do my best, but I'm completely humble and honest that you, you can't make a, a pairing. You can go easy as Fiona says, or try and do your best not to make it combative. Um, but yeah, I don't think there is any real answer to that. It depends what, what dishes are on the table. Um, but that's why, yeah, I do have a, a, a big bite of glass selection. If someone's really going the opposite way to the table, I just maybe offer them to sort of have a, a different glass from the selection instead of uh, going by the bottle. I would love to see more wines by the glass in restaurants. I always find that like really fun. And I also think people, by doing that too, it gets people to taste things they wouldn't normally taste and then they'll buy maybe, they'll spend more on a bottle than they usually would. Um, and actually, yeah, I mean, what I do with friends, I kind of call it the communion cup. Now, I, I probably can't do this now, like, due to COVID. But um, it's like, you know, I'll order, like, three different wines by the glass. Like, ask, or, like, ask for a sip. And, and I always say this to people, you know, if it's by the glass, the bottle will be open. You know, this is your opportunity to try new things. I always get so excited when I see a really well-considered wines by the glass. And then we just, like, pass the cup round. <laughs> the communion cup no, 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 can't do that now. <laughs> can't do that now. i know this was like bc this is bc before covid yeah. and so, like i would yeah like the communion cup and um and then i'd be like okay who likes wine number one who likes one? and like you know then you might get two different bottles but I, what i do find is it gets people excited people are willing to spend more they're not just looking at a grape or a price at that point i mean in terms of the future of wine lists and restaurants being able to cater for really interesting wines by the glass obviously that is an issue right like it's, it's the preservation of the wine it's kind of taxing i guess it's having to really teach your psalms or people on the floor so that they know about all you know, they have to really know their stuff could, could it be the case that actually we should be ordering in like kegs or different kinds of um containers and vessels to store wine in, in restaurants to allow for the variety i mean yeah space in a restaurant is always always a, a, an issue i mean i love keg wines I, I i love wine on tap but you'd still have to install a system and have space for the keg and the taps as right. well so it's not right. necessarily um a solution if you have an outdoor space yeah it's amazing um but yeah i think i've become quite astute at um packing away wines and finer spaces uh, i think roca was the best one it was actually the customer's uh the customer's wardrobe the closet behind i had a wine rack so i had to nip through and grab a bottle sometimes uh, you just kind of find your space <laughs> as best you can um you know how many restaurants actually have all their wine under their bonquettes <laughs> and then they have to do the stock up in the evening we, we kind of do what we can but i think i think you know having coravan is amazing because then you have the opportunity to put more obscure wines and more expensive wines that you wouldn't be able to necessarily taste and try so so, so that's great and then i think you just really need to be good at, at your selection and like say train train your team if you see a wine's not selling for a couple of days just taste the wine in a briefing talk to the guys about it get them talking about it and, and you seem soon see to start the wine sale and if it doesn't sell well just change it asap i think you, you buy the glass selection should be as malleable and as changeable as possible um, not just seasonally but also on, on on the dishes in the restaurant and of course whatever customers feel like drinking Oh, well, great. I think, I think this has been amazing. I've loved it. Um, 
and we haven't had any more final questions come in so i think i'll just uh, wrap up so big thank you to fiona for joining us big thank you to Calvin oh, for joining us. <laughs> thank you everyone <laughs> and uh, thank you amelia and yeah we don't we don't have another one next week uh, so no kind of little promo behind me to tell you what's on next week um but amelia and i will continue ch our little weekly chats over the summer and uh, if we come up with something for the autumn and if people are uh, interested then sign up to um my newsletter on princessinthepino.com and I'll let you know whatever I'm doing and whatever Amelia's doing or sign up to Amelia's uh, newsletter as well. Um, you know, we're both in touch and tell everyone what we're both doing. So yeah, so it's been really loving, lovely having you um, all join us uh, for the lockdown. And yeah, we're gonna go and have a little break um, over the summer. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you guys so much. And like, this is like, from, like such an important connection with the UK. So thank you. It's meant a lot to me having these weekly webinars. And thank you so much, Soma. You are awesome. And you're organized. You say you can't multitask and that's absolute bollocks. Um, sorry, I'm just gonna say you are amazing. Very organized, fantastic multitasker and I've loved absolutely adored doing these webinars with you so thank you oh thank you all right thank you everyone I shall end this see you guys bye bye bye, thank you, bye.